computer there, whatever what's best for you. Okay, like so. Yeah, it's all right. Okay. So good morning. Before I get started, uh, as we, you know, we talked about what's going on in Ukraine, I can tell you another difference that you can think about is that on the Ukrainian side, there are many, many chaplains. And the gospel is going forth in, in, in many different places on the, along the front lines and in various areas. And you have lots of Protestant chaplains. On the other side, I, I can't imagine there's any Protestant chaplains. And there might be one or two, I'm very skeptical and very doubtful, uh, basically, they're just, they throw water on them as they go out to the front lines, and that's about it. Holy water. So, uh, you know, these are, it's a very serious time, and uh, Paul himself lived in very serious times. And so we're going to take a look at that from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18 this morning. So that's going to be our focus. And the Apostle Paul was a man that went through many difficult trials. And all the songs we sang, especially the first one, uh, that's almost like a, a, his banner. I mean, th this was his whole life, and we're going to see those very same themes uh, taught specifically in this scripture, verse chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. So why don't we just go ahead and read these verses, and then we'll kind of go through them and explain them. We'll simplify them, explain them as best as we can, and hope to encourage you and teach you something that will you can take home with you this week. Notice Paul says, verses 7 to 18, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God, not from ourselves. That's a hard lesson to teach people. It's hard for God's people to learn that lesson. Our world doesn't understand us. We are fallen, weak creatures. And we have many problems. And the world right now is in sorry shape. It's really bad, guys. And so only God's grace can answer these problems. And yet people don't want God's grace today. And it's a, it's a difficult thing. Paul is going to explain to us exactly what is going on, that this is the, the worldview, the biblical worldview, the, the mindset you have to have to get through the difficulties of this, of this world. Paul lived in the Roman Empire, very pagan. Uh, sexual immorality was everywhere. Sexual madness, pornography was basically a way of life in terms of what people, you know, sex was very public. And so we're going back to that. And we see a lot of the uh, results of what's happening when people say no to God, but this is the world that he lived in. So notice he says, so the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. <laughs> so you see, there's a little bit of hope there, right? There's always hope at the end. You know, we're we're going to go through something that's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, but it's not total destruction, right? Not total being crushed, perplexed. How many of you are perplexed? I mean, I'm perplexed. You know, it's, it's just madness what's going on today. I think I, at, at this point, from what I'm seeing, especially our political leaders, I, I don't think I've ever seen so much foolishness. Almost, it's like an insane asylum right now. And, and how do you live uh, with lunatics uh, that are making all the decisions? It's, it's a serious problem. And, and so we're going to have to go through some things as I surmise. And right now we're, we, we are, we've already been through something. And we have Ukrainian friends that are going through something very, very serious. We are, our home is there too. And we're not quite not sure what we're gonna do in the future. So everything is in limbo, but Paul was there many times. Notice he says, perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. Paul always relates the spiritual life to the death and resurrection of Christ in one form or another. Why? Because that's grace. That's where the grace comes from. This is what allows us to get through the problems of this life, to survive it. See, God's going to drag you through the problem by faith and grace. He's not going to remove the problem from you, guys. Sorry to tell you this, okay. You see, he wants you to grow spiritually in the spiritual life. And so what does that mean? He's going to take you through the problem. And as you go through the problems, he's going to help your faith grow. But we have to practice his grace. We have to practice the death and resurrection of Christ daily to get through it. And basically what he's explaining to us here is how the death and resurrection of Christ can help me today. Christ died for me in the past. He's been raised from the dead. That's a fact of 
salvation, salvation phase one, it's, it's a done deal. God did everything for you at the point of the cross. But now he has some things for you to do. It's salvation phase two, the spiritual life, sanctification. He wants you now to live the death and resurrection of Christ daily. So here's an example. Okay, you, we, the, life's, the problems of life will, are, are going to hit you. What are you going to do? And Paul is telling us exactly our mindset that we should have, our mindset of faith. Notice he says, also, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So he's really, this is a cross-resurrection lifestyle that he's talking about. By the way, the cross and resurrection of, of Jesus was a historical fact. What does that mean? That means that fact can become my facts today by faith. Uh, that's a, an objective fact of history. It's a done deal, but also, you know, Jesus was a real person. So all history is subjective and objective at the same time. So that is able to help you personally daily as you depend upon those facts which have already been established in the past. And those things will help you today. And then God has promises for the future, right? We call those prophecies, but really they're future facts. And that day is coming too. In the same way that Christ died and rose again is a fact, he's coming back. And the judge is coming back, guys. He he came, you know, like a, he came in love, right? And he's coming back at, with a sword. And right now, our world deserves it really bad. But we're going to let him take care of it. That's his job. It's not my job. It's not your job. This is a hard thing for many people. We want to take revenge. Uh, God knows how to take revenge better than any of us. And by the way, when people take their own revenge, they, they get on a crusade, uh, almost always they become worse than the people that they are against. God knows exactly what's going on. He's, it's not hidden. Okay, it's obvious. Okay, he's going to take care of business. Jesus is coming back with a sword. And we need to walk with him and be an example of grace to other people, regardless of you know what life is given to us. And you know life is very difficult most, most of the time. Uh, he keeps on going. Now, verse 12, application to the situation between Paul and the Corinthians. So Paul is suffering a lot. The Corinthians are living pretty good. <laughs> so he says, so death works in us. I mean, Paul has been through everything, okay, all kinds of problems. But life in you. So Paul's sacrifice is worth it. So see, these sacrifices, we don't think they're worth it, but guys, they do. They produce life in other people. So when you practice the, the death of Christ in your life daily, it's going to lead to something positive in somebody else's life. Quit thinking about you. I mean, you're just a sinner, barely saved by grace. We're all barely saved, guys. We're all a bunch of weak sisters. It doesn't matter, you know, and of course, the gender stuff, forgive me. Uh, we're all a bunch of, of foolish people, weak people. And we need to look at each other that we're fallen, yet we're also made in God's image. That needs respect. We are made in the image of Christ, each one of us. We're born of the Spirit. We're in God's family. You need to look at people in that way. Just forget everything else. That's hard to do. <laughs> but okay. that's the way. See, that's the life of faith. Resurrection's coming. We're all going to have resurrection glorified bodies. Start treating people like that. It's going to help you. They're going to be, you and I are going to have serious bodies, guys. We're going to be serious people. Start looking at each other that way. I know today, you know, we got all this uh, weaknesses of the flesh. I mean, I mean, I know, but by faith, I, I recognize these things to be true, and it's going to help me live each and every day and treat God's people especially, but everybody. I, I'm usually pretty nice to unbelievers. I'm actually a little harder on the believers because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, right? We're his children, yet we have to do so with respect and with love and with concern. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is concerned about here, and he is making tremendous sacrifices for this church, and they, they are causing him nothing but grief, okay? Uh, he says here, but having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written. So our faith is in what? It's in the Bible. We have lots of mystics today, guys. I, I, I'm running into this everywhere, everywhere in the world. I don't care where I'm going. I got people telling me all the time, God is speaking to me, this and that and the other thing, uh, all these miracles and everything else. Okay, look at our faith is based on God's word. That's the most important thing. 
And this is not, you know, it's so obvious, and yet people have a hard time with it. So it's so obvious the Bible doesn't even mention a lot. And that people use that as an excuse to ignore the Bible. Don't do that. The Bible is a very serious book, and the Bible way, the Bible, when you practice the Bible, the Word of God by faith, that will be a better experience than anything this world, mysticism, philosophical, religious, or otherwise, can ever offer you. Because you are practicing the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life daily. Nothing can compare to that. No mysticism can grant that. No philosophy can give you that. No religion can grant that. Think about that. It's an amazing thing that God has established for us. So he says, I believed, therefore I spoke. Okay, we, we believe first, right? Then we speak. So what does that do? When we believe God's word, okay, then the word goes into the heart. And then I can say something. Think about it. Uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, you know, he, he was revealed, the glory of God was revealed to him in Isaiah 6. And he's in the temple. And God reveals himself to Isaiah. And the first thing that Isaiah notices about himself is his mouth. The sins of the tongue. And then he lives in a people. The same problem. Okay, the propaganda, guys, is really thick. It's really thick. And Isaiah was a man that the angel came and cleansed his tongue so he could be a prophet. Uh, angels are, are here even today, guys. You can't see them. They're watching. What's going on in Marlow Baptist Church today? What's going on in your life today? They are actually sent to be messengers to help the people of God. They are messengers. And we need to focus on the word because that is what enables us. You see, they are messengers of the word. And when you apply the word in your life daily, that keeps them busy. they got things to do, taking care of you. Think about it. Even those things are going on. We don't pay attention to it, but it's true. Notice, keep, Paul keeps on going, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. So there's, you know, we're all going to be resurrected together. We call that the rapture of the church. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And really, each at the end of every chapter. For all things are for your sakes. That's interesting. All things are for what? For, for who? For you. That's amazing. God's concerned about you. Uh, we're perplexed, but God's still concerned, right? We're, we're being persecuted, but God's still concerned. Okay, we have all these problems, but God still cares. It's for your sakes. So that the grace, which is spreading to more and more people, may cause the giving of thanks to abound the glory of God. What God wants is to see grace among other people. But we, we have got to be teaching the grace of God. We've got to get churches, again, teaching the grace of God. I mean, this is almost a, a concept that people don't even teach anymore. I've taught, look at, I've been all over the world, guys, okay? Grace is the last thing that people talk about. And then I go there to different places and I start bugging people about grace because that's my responsibility. And they get irritated, but that's good. That's good. That's what grace is for, because that's all we have. We have lots of self-righteous, you know, moral people that are, they're trying to, they're doing do-gooder stuff, but they're not practicing the death and resurrection of Christ in their lives, one is supernatural, the other is just human do-gooder stuff. It's not going to last. And it's self-righteous. It's full of pride. Here, it is. there's not, nothing prideful going on here, guys. <laughs> okay, nothing prideful. And, and, and all these things that goes on in life, they're they designed to humble us. That, that's what's going on. And the only way I'm going to get through this is by God's grace. And Paul understands that. Therefore, he has a conclusion, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. So don't be discouraged. I mean, I'm, I, this is probably the saddest time of my life right now because of this war. Uh, of course, COVID didn't help me either. I, I got stuck you know, in, in Armenia, but that's another story. Uh, actually, the Lord opened up some amazing doors in Armenia because of that. Uh, what happened in Armenia is that all the competition was removed from me. Just, they were gone. Okay. All the short-termers that come in, the short-term missionaries and and all the things that go on with that, it, it's kind of a, you need to have boots on the ground to make short-term missions work. And if you don't have that, it creates lots of problems. And, and a lot of short-term missionaries don't understand that. So that they come in and out and it's just chaos. 
And then of course they're milking the money, you know, it's, 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 and they have no idea after they leave what's going on in these churches. You, you have to have boots on the ground. And so the competition was removed and, and we taught some serious books. No one else could guide. I taught them Romans. I was teaching the book of, uh, we taught Galatians. We taught uh, Revelation, Daniel, Proverbs, Psalm 119, just, you know, recently. But it opened up the door in which we could teach some very serious books. And Armenia, you know, it needs, it's the same kind of a problem. Armenia could easily become the next Ukraine. It, it's almost already there. The Artsakh people had to leave. The Artsakh, which is, uh, Armenians have been there for thousands of years. Thousands. And two months ago, whatever, four, four or five months ago, they were told, uh, you, the Russian soldiers knocked on their door and they said, we can't protect you anymore. And they're all over the place in Armenia now. Very small country, surrounded by Muslims. And Russia's doing nothing for them. And of course, the West wants to corrupt them. You know, it's, it's, it's the same problem. And uh, so here we are. But what are we going to do? Well, we have these verses. This is what we do. This is our, regardless of all that, just forget that. Okay, this is what we need to be focused on. And then, you know, Paul went through all this stuff. You know, he, he you know, he... During the Jewish war, you know, he would have been, in, uh, he was still living when it first, probably, maybe not, but probably so when it first started. Roman Empire, you know, all the things going on. So we do not lose heart, he says, but through our, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Wow. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. That's a pretty good exchange rate, guys. Eternal weight of glory. That's coming. This is what I said. You know, uh, what's coming is going to be unbelievable. We should believe it, but it's so great that it, it's it's going to be shocking. And that day's coming. Eternal weight of glory. That speaks of uh, something very heavy, far beyond all comparison. So whatever we go through this life is nothing compared to what's coming. And this also allows you to get through it. See. As you look back at what Jesus did for you perfectly, finally and forever, you look forward to what's coming. That's going to help you get through what's going on now. And we have too many preachers that are taking that away. Their future, their past salvation, it's not secure. Their future salvation is not secure. And so then people are struggling. Okay, look at our foundations have to be there so that I know that the past is taken care of. I know the future is taken care of. Therefore, I can walk as God has commanded me to walk without a problem. You know, in terms of faith, I'm not talking about problems of life. God has it all set up for us to do that. And you have to secure the foundations. You have to secure the future. And if I have that, I, I walk the straight line, you know, God's word, right? And I do that, and uh, that'll help me get through the problems. And then what does he say? While we, no, we not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we have to ha learn to have an eternal perspective. However, remember, God came down into time. Jesus, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, ministered to Israel. He really died. That's a fact. He really was raised. That's a fact. Okay, so God's eternal nature was revealed in the God-man. And he did a perfect work for us. And now that he's gone to heaven... He's given us the spirit of God because he's now in heaven. We now finally, for, for the first time in human history, there's a human being in heaven representing us before a holy God. And that human being is glorified and perfect. And through that representation, we have access to God. And that's designed to help you get through the trials of life. Let's go to take a look at the next slide. I'll, I'll, we'll look at some of these verses. Yeah, there we go. So here we have sort of a summary of what's going on in these verses. Verses 7 to 11 the divinely powerful treasure of God's word shines through our weak bodies so that when we, we can live now the resurrection life of Christ through the many crosses this fallen world troubles us with. So God's word is, is go, supposed to go right here. Uh, th this heart, by the way, guys, is empty. There's, there's nothing here. And what God wants to do is write the word on your heart. Okay. And to give you a big heart. We get the Bible in the heart. There's actually an interesting verse in Psalm 119 that you kind of Get it inside there and stretch out the heart to go around the word of God and you get a big heart like this. And that's going to enable you to 
that's a light that shines to not only to other people, but I mean, to, to yourself as well, also shines before God. He sees all that. He's working through that. When you're practicing God's word, the glory of God is at work. That's the true miracle of the spiritual life that most people don't even care about. That's the miracle that matters. That's the miracle that changes us daily. It's called a treasure. This book is a treasure, guys. An absolute treasure. If you really believe that, you're going to spend more time with this book. It is a treasure. Uh, verses 12 to 15, Paul's life-giving sacrificial ministry of preaching the word of grace. That, see, when you teach grace, you, that involves sacrifice. Uh, you're going to be opposing everything that's going on. <laughs> it, it's all, there, there's so much legalism and mysticism everywhere, and, and, and even in our churches, guys. And you have to teach them the word of God, the word of grace to get to punch through all that stuff. That's what Jesus did, by the way, in all these synagogues. He goes to these synagogues, okay? And what's he doing? He's teaching the grace of God. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, that is are his theme verses. He's teaching the grace of God, not legalism. And what's happening? The demons are they're getting upset. Physically, they're starting to come out of people. They're screeching. Because they use legalism to dominate people. That's the, that's the game. They use legalism to control people. Mysticism, legalism to control their lives. And Jesus comes in there and punches through all of that religious pride, foolishness, sin. And then the demons start getting concerned. See, the preaching of, of God's grace, this is what causes the problems among demons, guys. They don't, all these little things that a lot of Christians talk about, they don't, they, they use that. It's, it's God's grace. This is what challenges them, irritates them, and they're against it. Paul calls it a doctrine of demons. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 4. What is it? Asceticism, legalism, chapter 1, and then also chapter 4. And this is not our plan. Uh, notice verses 12 to 15 again, so uh, the glory of God, cross and resurrection, the verses 16 to 18, conclusion, the perplexities of this very troubled fallen world should therefore not discourage us despite our many frailties as unseen and eternal forces are deeply at work within the saints. We don't see them, but by faith in the word, I recognize they're real. There's some awesome things, God. I, I, I mean awesome things that are going on when you practice God's word by faith. That's God's special word, his own personal word, guys. He is supernaturally working behind the scenes to establish something very positive in your life. Let's take a look at the next slide. What is this treasure in earthen vessels? Is that what we got there? Uh, here's a, we already read verses 7 to 11, 2 Corinthians, but also the context. 2 Corinthians 3 helps us understand what that treasure is. If you look, at we, I, and I assume that you, that you already taught this, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, uh, Paul, he's an apostle. He's teaching, right? So the apostolic instruction of God's word written on the tablets of human hearts. We have to get God's word from, you know, from the pulpit or from your life when you read it, whatever it is, onto the heart. Solomon commands us in Proverbs chapter 7 to write the word of God on your heart. Why? Because your heart's empty. It's just an empty tablet. <laughs> There's nothing there. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah tells us that, uh, you know, the heart is desperately wicked. And then he says something interesting else along with it. Who can understand it? The answer is nobody. Sin is, you cannot understand it. It's irrational. And all the religious people are trying to understand it. <laughs> and then they're telling us all this legalism to solve. Goodness, goodness. It is, you know, Paul says in Romans 7, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm doing the very thing I hate. Honest discussion. I mean, haven't we been there, right? I mean, I've been there. I mean, have you been there? I, I think so, if we're honest. So we need to get the word of God on the heart. That's what Paul is doing. He's teaching them. And who does that? The spirit of God. Proverbs chapter one. If you listen to my instruction, it says, wisdom shouts in the streets. It's available. Everybody, most people, even in English, still have a Bible. They have a tremendous legacy history behind it. We've enjoyed London, looking at all the legacy of God's word that played a powerful impact in this nation. That's all gone now. And it's a disaster, moral disaster, political disaster all over the place. 
but yet that heritage is still there. Wisdom still shouts in the streets. You can go down to the British Library and you can look at all kinds of biblical archaeological facts there. And then this week we went to a, a museum on the east of London and some Baptist pastor has a treasure of all kinds of old English Bibles and other books too of the Reformation. Unbelievable. I even looked at the papal bull that uh, the Pope signed to you know, arrest and take care of Martin Luther. You teach God's grace, what happens? Okay, you're going to have opposition. That's rooted in history. And a lot of guys, they don't teach grace because they don't want to pay the price. That, you know, Paul's concerned about that. Uh, then 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, the new covenant, right? Truths, New Testament truths. They are taught by the Spirit of God that pierces through the veil of the hardened hearts to grant spiritual freedom. So the Spirit of God is what makes us free. Free to do what? Free to serve. What is freedom for? The Bible talks about this very specific in Galatians 5 and other places. Freedom is for service. It's for service. By the way, if you can't free, if you're not free, you can't serve according to God's way. It's very important. Our society, you know, everybody's against freedom, they're against grace. It's the same thing. I don't care if it's political, religious, whatever. Okay. They're against those things. They're attacking freedom all the time as if it's sin. And they're attacking grace all the time as if it leads to sin. That is not true. That is a false doctrine. That's exactly what the devil wants you to think. So you won't care about freedom and you won't care about grace. That's the devil's game plan. And he's got everybody bamboozled right now on a huge scale. The propaganda is really thick. It's up to the ears, you know, right up here. Under legalism, under law, that's where all sin takes place, guys. Every last sin you do, it's always under the law. The law doesn't stop you, guys. It's only the grace of God stops sin. Only the grace of God can make you holy. Grace and righteousness, grace and holiness, they work together. Pastor Brecko, my favorite Bible teacher of all time, used to say the purity of God's grace will lead to a pure lifestyle. Yeah. That's hard. To, that, that's our job. That's our responsibility to teach people that. The Spirit of God does that. Our hearts are hard, and the Spirit of God will soften spiritually that same heart. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, the light of the gospel that reveals the face of Christ. So again, that goes back to the message. And then verses 5, that's chapter 5 coming up, is all illustrated by an earthly tent of the tabernacle. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then verses 11 to 21, we have the fear of the Lord and the word of reconciliation. So what is that treasure? It's God's word written on the heart. And that makes your heart really valuable. Issues of the heart. I saw a couple of signs on that, uh, teaching that. Well, that's exactly what we're doing this morning. Let's go to the next slide. The tabernacle. Where was the word of God in the tabernacle, guys? Think about this. Where was it? It was inside the Holy of Holies. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, what was there? The, 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 the written word of God, written by the finger of God, was inside of the Ark of the Covenant. That's a picture of your heart. And the word of God is to be placed there. Amazing. We are a walking tabernacle of God on the earth. And Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So the temple, okay, that's just a ritual. It's just a model. Okay, the tabernacle is just a ritual and a model. The reality is now inside of your heart, inside of your body. So when Paul says you have this treasure in earthly bodies, okay, these fallen bodies, clay vessels, the word of God, okay, is like a treasure that shines through. It's just like a, this is a picture of it. What's really going on? The glory of God. Where was the glory of God in the tabernacle? He was inside his living room. Inside the tabernacle, inside the Holy of Holies, on his throne, inside the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of Glory. Let's go to the next slide. If you have it, like a little quick history survey of the book of Exodus, chapters 1 to 13, you know, they're all in slavery in the house of Egypt, right? Been there a long time. God redeems them, Passover redemption. So first of all, they're saved by grace, right? That's a history lesson. And then later, God gives them the law, Mosaic law, right? Obedience comes later. First of all, salvation comes first, and then the law. Everybody talks about law first, and then maybe salvation. 
backwards. It's backwards. It's not right. But this is what we have. Okay. And they are violating the history of the text. How do they do that? Through mysticism. They ignore the history of the text. This is why the historical foundation of the Bible are so important. History matters. Why were people, so many people attacking the history of the Bible? Because they want you to think mysticism. That's why. They want you to get away from the facts of, of your faith. If they do that, they win the game. God doesn't want that. Chapter 14 and 15, they're all Baptists, right? They're baptized twice. Baptized, you know, dry through the Red Sea, and then they're baptized by the cloud, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So then, the, so then they get baptized. First they're saved, redeemed. Now they're baptized, right? So we're all believers' baptism, right? And then chapter 16 of 17, divine discipline, sanctification, the battle for God's grace. People start, what do they start doing? Complaining. That was the big sin of the Exodus generation. Complaining. I mean, I, I do this, right? I mean... Do you, right? I assume we, look, it, it's the same, guys. If you were out in the desert, okay, like these people, what would you be doing? Be the same? Okay, I mean, this idea of the Exodus generation is like a really bad generation. Well, that's true, but I don't think people today are be any better, guys. It, it's, a, it's a history lesson. Watch out. Chapter 18 Basically, we have these judges that are sort of like they become like the elders of the so-called, you know, they didn't have a church back then, but the elders that will make decisions. Why do they need these judges to judge what's going on? Because everybody's complaining against each other all the time. They're fighting amongst themselves. In churches, what's the big problem? In mission work, okay, what's the big, the, the, everybody is fighting amongst themselves. I've seen this everywhere, guys. It's everywhere. That's a history lesson. I'm not talking about theological idealism. I'm not talking about theological mysticism. We have a lot of this going on. It's just mysticism. And then they can't figure out why God's people are not living the life that they should be living. Well, it's because you've taught them theological mysticism, theological idealism. You have not prepared them for the battle of life. It's very difficult. You're a sinner. You're weak. You need the grace of God. Without it, you're, you're nothing. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. See. And then chapters 19 to 24, they enter the Mosaic Covenant. And that, the Ten Commandments. But guys, you got to realize, okay, they also entered it. They were, you know, Moses put sacrificial blood on them. So even with the Mosaic Law, you have grace. There's lots of grace in Moses, the Law of Moses. People don't get that, but it's true. And then chapters 25 to 40, the tabernacle is built and instituted and filled with God's glory. That's a paradigm for what, you know, what happens to us. Okay, we're saved by grace, we're redeemed by grace. Okay, uh, then we're you know, baptized, at least how we're supposed to do this, to show our salvation with God, to identify ourselves with God and his plan of salvation. Okay, and then the tabernacle, where, you know, the, then we obey God's word, follow his direction, and the tabernacle becomes put in our hearts. The glory of God fills us. That's, that's the game plan. And this is all historically illustrated even by the Exodus generation. So basically, the, what we would call the tabernacle was a model of the heavenly reality. So God was teaching Israel about what heaven was really like. See, no one has been to heaven. Jesus even says this several times in the book of John. How do you know what heaven's like? You don't. God had to reveal it. And then he had to build a tabernacle so they could understand what heaven was like. And by the way, Moses received written instructions on how to build that tabernacle. Remember Operation Golden Calf? You know, the sort of the, what I call the uh, entertainment worship that has infected the modern churches today. We have a lot of it. The Operation Golden Calf, you know, what I feel, the, sensu the sensuality of it all. Look at, that's a history lesson. Without God's word, that's exactly what you will do. You'll turn God's worship into entertainment. It's the same problem, guys. These are history lessons. It's not some theological fantasy, guys. These are history lessons. This is what God's people do. We, are, we have Egypt in our hearts. It's still there. And only God's word can, can get through that, see. So the tabernacle was written instructions. And they had, then they had to be filled with the Spirit to build that tabernacle. So not only did they have the word of God, but they also had to be filled with the Spirit to get that tabernacle built. So the Spirit of God working with the Word of God, that's how the spiritual life operates. Working together, not apart, not separate, but together. 
And that becomes now the basis for worship. And by the way, this is now going to become the place where God is going to reveal himself. After that tabernacle is built, we have a media mediation place where God is now going to reveal his word much more massively than ever before. The Old Testament is going to grow. Later, they build the temple. And Isaiah received that message, for example, from God through the angels, okay, in the Jerusalem temple, the model. Yet he saw the real thing when he was there. See that? So that's the point. What's going on here? Amazing things. By the way, now your heart is like a little tabernacle. So the Ark of the Covenant is a type of God's throne. Let's go to the next slide here. There's the model, right? And there's the, the reality. I mean, uh, the re reality is in heaven. The model's on the earth. Let's go to the next slide. What do we got here? So the Ark of the Covenant is a type of God's throne in his heavenly palace. So, see, Paul says to become all things to all men, right? So, I'm in England, and so we, we'll call God's tabernacle his castle, right? His, uh, you know, his, uh, <laughs> we'll call it his palace, okay? So, and it's true. God has a palace in heaven. It's amazing. And the tabernacle was what? It was a model of that. And the Ten Commandments were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Safe, secure. It's like a, it's like a safety deposit box. Safe and secure. What gets inside the heart, guys, is safe and secure. Think about it. Once it's written down, it's like you're putting money in the bank. You know, putting money in the heart. Investment is going on, and that investment is secure for all time. Jesus even talks about that. Let's take a look at the next slide. So the Ark of the Covenant represents the very throne of God. What does Isaiah 66 say? Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you will build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is the person that God is, that is interested in especially. God wants you to be that person. This is a treasure. You start, and this is better than going to the banks of England, okay? Better than any British pound you'll ever find. Better than digital, digital, you know, whatever currency they're talking about today. Better than silver and gold. Solomon says that. Solomon had a rich kingdom. And he said God's word was better than any jewel you'll ever find. It's true. Take it serious, guys. This is an investment. If you understood there's money here, you're going to be there. We're not talking about physical money, although God will give that too. That's Solomon received it, remember. We're talking about spiritual treasures. And when God's word is in the heart, good things are happening. Let's take it. It's a, it's a good investment. Let's go to the next slide. What do we got here? The glory of Yahweh, the glory of God, right? Filled the tabernacle. Yahweh is God's name in the, in the Old Testament. I am that I am. The burning bush that revealed himself to Moses. And what happened? The glory of the Lord filled that tabernacle. What does Paul tell us to command us to do in Ephesians 5.18? He says, be filled with the Spirit, right? Paul even says the same thing in Romans 15, 13 and 14. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So how do, how do I have peace and how do I have joy? It's by faith, guys. That's how it's done. Faith in God's word. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Everybody wants to be filled with the Spirit, but they don't want to study God's Word. That's a fantasy. It's just mysticism, guys. Notice Philippians 1, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And then Paul also says, Colossians 1, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of, of his will and all spiritual wisdom, understanding. God wants to fill your hearts with his word. It's a personal word. Yes, it's factual. Yes, it's doctrinal. But it's also very personal. All, this, all the things that you and I need. Let's take a look at the next slide. What do we have here? Very interesting picture, right? The tabernacle of man, that's what you are. So we go from the earthly heaven, right, to the earthly tabernacle. Now we have you. 
body. That's going on inside of your body. Serious things are happening. Very serious. The most serious things in life are happening inside of your body by faith in Christ, by faith in the word. Nothing else is like it, guys. Nothing even compares to it. Serious, glorious things are going on. Let's take it serious. Let's take a look at the next slide. What do we got here? We are to treasure God's word in our hearts, right? For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness. That's in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 4, 6, and 7, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Solomon tells us, Proverbs 2, he says, my son, right? Fathers need to teach their children the Bible. Be serious about it. My son, if, that's a big question, if, you know, to, to receive God's word. It's not automatic. Your salvation is secure by faith in Christ. It's a one-time deal, but are you going to walk with God? That's a different question. It's a big if. And a lot of Christians, pastors, are not teaching that. You have a responsibility here, guys. Does It's not automatic. If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, with you, make your ear attentive. What do you do with the ear? You listen. God made you with what? Two ears? One mouth. He made you to be a good listener, guys. Okay, and getting people to listen to God's word is almost impossible. Especially today. That's a contradiction. Yes, if you will call out for insight and raise your voice, there's prayer for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search it for it for hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Yahweh. There's God, you know, the I am that I am. And find the knowledge of God. For the Lord, notice, gives wisdom as grace. It's all grace. You have to have a grace attitude to get it. It's by faith. That's chapter 3, Proverbs. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And then chapter 7, one of my favorite passages, my son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. So what do you do with your eye? The apple of my eye is where? It's right here, you know, just like that. Right here. God's word. Keep my commandments to live. Keep my teaching in the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, you know, like a ring almost. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. You have to make this personal. This represents God's personal word, guys. You can't see him. You can't touch him. You can't feel him. Jesus already died and rose again. He's in heaven, okay? You have to make this personal. Make it real. It's available. It's factual. Subjectively, objectively, all that. Next slide. What do we got here? Treasures, more, lots of them. Even retribution. That's a treasure. Payday's coming. It's going to be a big payday, guys. Payday is coming, okay? And a lot of people are not going to be able to pay for it. And so they're going to have to pay. It's going to be awesome. Proverbs tells us, chapter 3, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her profit is better than the profit of silver, and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. A, a wisdom is called a lady. Lady Wisdom, chapter 8. So here, here's a, a woman, a beautiful woman that you know, men can date and still be married at the same time, and not commit adultery. By the way, Solomon spends a lot of time talking about adultery in chapter 5, chapter 7, uh, chapter 9, even a little bit in chapter 4. Talking to who? Leaders. Solomon's my son. These are going to be future political leaders of Israel. He talks about adultery all the time. If you betray your own wife, you will betray the nation. That's it. Very simple. What's, what's going on in politics today? Why do we have so much spiritual adultery going on, political adultery going on? It's because they're doing it physically, number one. And that leads to all kinds of other things, too. It's madness. 
It's so destructive. It destroys not only their own personal lives, but they, they share that destruction. When you're a leader, you share that destruction with other people, the entire nation. This is a huge problem today. It's really sad. Next slide. There's a God, the plan of God, right? Notice that line right there. See, that's that God, you know, we talked about the clouds being rolled back, okay? There, you know, God's word punches through that, you know, historically, his revelation in time. But it's only by God's word that we know about it. You and I cannot rise up ourselves above that line. It's not possible. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Only God, by grace, can punch through that. So I have to have a grace attitude to get it. So we have God's heavenly throne, right? He reveals himself in time. And then, you know, that's like an arrow. God shoots an arrow. It goes down into the earth. And I grab that arrow by faith. And I take it serious. And it's a very select arrow. It's not, you know, not everything. It's something very specific that's been revealed in God's word. And that helps me hang on to something in this world that's in serious trouble. Let's take a look at the next slide. Paul's allusion to the Psalm 116 in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 12 to 15, he says, believe and speak. Paul is actually quoting from David, who also a man went through many trials and tribulations. And he was someone that walked with God in spite of all the difficulties. What did David do? By the way, he talks about the tabernacle all the time. And most of David's life, there was no tabernacle. It was this religious chaos, okay? Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in some priest's backyard, okay? And, you know, the, the Saul killed a bunch of priests. They, they ripped up the tabernacle, at Shiloh. I mean, all kinds of things were going on. But David read the word. He read Leviticus. He read the book of Exodus. He read the book of Deuteronomy, Numbers. And that tabernacle was in his heart. And then he wrote all these psalms to talk about that. He took it with him. Take the tabernacle of God, the word of God with you, guys, when you go, out, when you go home today, when you walk out of here, when you, whatever you're doing, on the job, that's what God wants. And then you're going to be a light to those people. Don't worry about their responses. Forget that. You just walk with God and, and treasure the word of God in your heart, grow in grace, and you're going to be a testimony to other people. And you can affect people better than the pastor can because you know them. They know you personally. Next slide. It's last slide. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. I mean, I'm very discouraged. I am okay right now. Okay. But Paul says, don't be discouraged. Uh, Galatians 6, verse 9, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Payday is coming, guys. It's coming. And God's got sealed up in his treasuries. It's all sealed up. Judgment day. And he's going to open up that account at some point in the future. And that account is deep. It's called a treasury. And God's going to pay back everything. So don't worry about taking justice. Your justice today is to give the gospel of grace. That's the justice that we need to be focused on. And yeah, we can talk about politicians and their adultery. It's okay. John the Baptist lost his head when he did that. But to you know, to get, go on all this other stuff that you know, the crusades—you got to be careful of that. John the Baptist did not go on a protest or crusade. Uh, he just said what was going on, just speaking the word. Okay, <laughs> so he got his. Uh, it's just the word of God that does this. Don't be, but don't let that discourage you. Thank you very much. Shall we close in prayer, right? Okay, let us pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful. We thank you for your grace and mercy to us. Thank you that your word, Lord, is a treasure that we can hang on to. Lord, you have given us so many blessings, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed is we have all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. They're written down for us, so by faith we can believe it. And we pray that these riches would strengthen us. They would give us wisdom. They would help us to grow. They would help us to become godly in our present evil age. That they would give us encouragement, as Paul says. Give us hope, as Paul says. In spite of our perplexity. In spite of our troubles. In spite of the desperation sometimes that we see in our personal lives. Help us to cling on to your word by faith. 
Pray you would help us to make the word of God personal to our lives daily and help us, Lord, to look forward to the future in hope and in grace. These things we humbly ask from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.